My name is Adam Petronovic. I'm the chief data scientist for Prognos Health. I just want to first thanks, thanks for uh, Amazon to inviting us out here to kind of speak in front of you today. Um, and really what I want to do today is kind of take you through who is Prognos, what do we do, um, introduce a problem that we face here about predicting patient risk, predicting, predicting patient cost. I want to take you through the model that we currently have in production. And then really dive into like what's the implement like how do we implement this on the AWS stack, um, and then open up the questions by all of you. So first, like who who are Prognos? Who are we? What do we do? Um, we are an AI company that that works in healthcare. Uh, we've been around for about nine years, and we service everyone from payers to uh, labs themselves uh, to pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we Life sciences companies identify uh, patients that may benefit from drug treatments. Uh, we help diagnostic companies essentially uh, predict disease earlier. Um, and we also help uh, these large payers kind of predict patient costs based on, on clinical lab data. And if you see here, we have a lot of key partners and clients here. Uh, we work with uh, Merck, you know, Novartis, Cigna, all these large uh, national institutions. Uh, we've been, we're also a VC-backed company. We've been invested by Cigna, Merck, uh, Guardian, a bunch of other different ventures. And really all of these culminate in us trying to accomplish our mission here, which is really to improve health by driving the best actions learned from the world's And first I want to introduce really our data set. You know, what are we working with when we build these types of predictive models? Um, we have over 200 million unique U.S.-based patients um, and over 20, up to 25 billion now clinical lab records. If you've ever had a blood test done in the United States, we probably have your data. Um, this is everything from uh, uh, different types of tests, anatomic, anatomical pathology reports, and molecular diagnostic reports. It is actually the largest cross-lab aggregation of clinical lab data. Now, what you don't know about labs that I learned when I first came to Prognos is that labs are very siloed. Um, a lab like LabCorp or Quest Labs, they have different um, formats for lab data. They, they, things are stored different. They even have tef different test ranges. If you uh, get lab tests done, depending on the lab, it will actually have slightly different results because of the methodology and how they do things. What we have done is essentially brought and harmonized uh, all those labs' uh, data into one kind of universal repository. It brings us into our data lake, where we essentially have you know, uh, diagnostic data that's really unorganized, and we've spent years essentially imposing a schema, a field harmonization, really getting it uh, set up for actual predictive modeling which sets us up for a, a suite of different algorithms and solutions. And so the, the types of things we do with, with this large data store, um, we have things that are what we call basically clinical interpretations. So in addition to you know, the team of data scientists and engineers here, we have a lot of clinicians on staff where they actually look at test results and interpret them. Uh, things that like, what are your ICD codes? Uh, what are the, uh, is the test in the right relevant range? Uh, who's the treating provider and whatnot? But on also on top of those clinical solutions, we built certain profiles for actually diagnosing, diagnosing diseases. And this is essentially um, a lot of deterministic rules where we say patients uh, that have this ICD code plus uh, this lab test result at this age, at this gender, generally is associated with diabetes or chronic kidney disease. Um, and what's been exciting over the last several years is that we've really embraced and, and got deep into machine learning and artificial intelligence, which is really where the purpose of this talk is going, is saying, now that you have this large data asset, what are you doing with it from a predictive modeling point of view? Uh, and and, the, and the, the use case that I want to showcase today is, is how we predict patient risk or essentially patient cost. Um, and I'm going to frame it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a math guy, I'm the data scientist, so I'm going to frame it a little bit like a math problem. Uh, as we introduced it. Whoops. Okay, so here's, here's essentially the challenge. Uh, given a set of N patients, subgroup I, uh, predict that set's relative future cost against the, uh, the, against the population's average. Um, and this is a case where, once again, the, the, the lar uh, large numbers hold. So the, lar the larger patient pool that you're trying to predict, it, the more it's going to be. Uh, the more it's going to be fit towards the, uh, the 
Um, uh, there's high cost variance in smaller sets of patients. Um, now, we will only know the set of patients at time of request, um, and uh, we're targeting an average response time of less than a minute. So the, the, the business application of this is essentially setting premiums. So given a set of patients, am I, are we able to predict how much they cost uh, next year? And kind of just diagramming this, you know, you have this huge plethora of, of, of patients. Um, and at request time, we're going to get a set of three random patients or n random patients. Uh, we will be able to run our predictive algorithms. And then based on those patients' historical lab data, we're going to uh, be able to make a prediction of where that set sits within a larger distribution. Uh, so first, I want to kind of take a look at some of the data here. So this is real-world data of how much do patients cost in the United States uh, on average. This is the, on the x-axis, you see their monthly premium, and on the y-axis is the density of this. So uh, this distribution um, is, if you talk to an actuary, it's called the Tweedy distribution. Uh, for, the, for the math nerds, uh, it's, it's a negative binomial or a zero, zero inflated Poisson distribution. There's a lot of density around zero because if you think about it, people in general, you know, on average may not even see a doctor in a year or may not even have a hospital vision. But then you have this long tail, right, which is, which is, the, uh, which is a lot of where the cost is generated. Um, I believe the average U.S. monthly premium or the actually monthly cost for a patient is about $400. But we see, you know, depending on serious conditions like hemophilia, um, uh, uh, serious cancers, um, uh, to have monthly costs up to, um, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars per month in medical expenses. Um, and now when we look at it at the set level, um, we, we once again see the, the, uh, the cone of large numbers here. Um, in the x-axis, we have the set size. So you can think of this as the groups of patients that we are looking at. Um, and in the uh, y-axis, we have their monthly premiums. Um, and it makes sense when you kind of look at it. You say, okay, this blue line is the average uh, for, that, uh, for that set size. Um, the dotted lines are the 25th and 75th percentiles, and the uh, min and max are these areas. So you can actually see as the set of patients go, the variance decreases, right? We converge uh, over there to the mean. So right, okay, kind of understand the data, kind of understand the problem. Um, now, how are we setting it up and how are we modeling this? So I wanted to, I now I want to talk about our production model that we actually have uh, in, in market right now and how we predict patient cost. So uh, our modeling approach was a wide and deep framework. Um, uh, we use both uh, a deep learning neural net approach as well as clinical features. Um, and so ultimately the machines haven't won yet, right? This problem hasn't been fully solved by artificial intelligence. Um, we actually also encode uh, manual data. And so these lab results for each patient are longitudinal, um, meaning that at every point, at any point in time, we have a patient with their observed test date. So if, if Steve in Ohio had a blood test um, on Thursday, we have the date, the time step, and the test result. This is a longitudinal data set. So that sets us up really for sequence to sequence models in terms of uh, deep learning frameworks, right? It really lets us turn and take all of this data and throw it through the, uh, the large distributed matrix algebra that we call, you know, RNNs, right, or sequence models. And what you see here is on the learn features is essentially we take all of the medical data that we aggregate essentially about months to deal with sparsity and pass through to create a machine learned vector representation of all of the clinical data. So if you can think about it, every patient in our, um, uh, in our repository um, has literally a 128 element vector and bettering of their entire lab history, right? And that's one component of, of the model itself. We also use what we call clinical features. And this is the, you know, the human encoding of knowledge where we say, look, um, I'm gonna look at this data, I'm gonna apply uh, some of our manual decision rules or determinant models that say, look, um, given uh, this A1C score at this time and this age, I know that this person is a diabetic, right? So we take essentially a uh, one hot encoded vector of clinical features, and then we concatenate it to our learned features, learned vector representation, and we pass it to a GLM to predict patient cost. And so uh, a little bit more uh, succinctly saying here, 
um, we really essentially do this in two stages, right? So at the individual level, we come up with vector representations of data, which is actually in production we have an RNN that is basically bidirectional using LSTM cells. Um, and then our manual features have, you know, 100 or so manually encoded binary one hot and things. We concatenate them, pass them through a GLM. Uh, um, and then once you have those member level predictions, we then roll them up to the group level. So predict at the member level and then predict again at the set level um, to return a patient score. Uh, and at the set level, we're using a, a random forest. Um, I believe we played with a, a million different types of algorithms. So um, now that we kind of have this model or way that we do this, how do you implement something like this? And we have like a really interesting scenario that kind of guided how we did the architecture in this. So uh, a couple implementations uh, for the implementation of this algorithm. Uh, first, um, the individual level predictions could be generated at any time. So if we have 26 billion, um, and they could be pre-calculated, excuse me. So if you have 26 billion data points, 200 million patients, um, we can kick off a job every week and have those basically stored um, uh, in an S3 bucket or some sort of, uh, of data store in those predictions. Um, but at prediction time, we won't know who the people are in that set. So we have to apply essentially the second stage of the model on the fly. Or our AP, um, our subject is fairly bursty requests. So there'll be long periods of, of um, no requests. And then maybe a Friday or a Monday when a bunch of uh, predictions need to come in, we'll get a bunch of bursty requests that need to execute the model. How did we, um, how did we implement this? Uh, we made several uh, key architecture that really made this easy and kind of fly for us. Uh, first and foremost, Amazon SageMaker has served us very well uh, here at Prognos. Uh, the implementation currently we're using uh, TensorFlow, but it's very easy to switch over to PyTorch, which we're doing right now. Um, it allows you to have uh, bring your own Docker containers, right? This is that eased up for teams. Uh, the, the host or GPU accelerated. It really allowed us to train a model quickly and easily. And also, it's not shown in this, we're also now using uh, Amazon SageMaker ground truth for actually even the labeling of the data. Um, now, uh, our data, because it's, um, it's not massive, right? We're talking about roughly about 10 terabytes of data. That's actually not large in the grand scheme of things. Most of our things are actually stored in Parquet files and S3 buckets. Um, the technology that's come out is S3 Select that actually allows us to do quick lookups and quick scans um, of that without going to an in-memory database solution. It's a massive cost savings for us. Um, and, then, and then finally was the Amazon Lambda architecture that we use actually at several stages of this algorithm approach. We actually serve SageMaker models through Amazon Lambda architecture. Um, uh, when we're not using servers, we, we uh, are any requests, we don't have any servers. It's, it's officially a serverless architecture, which was interesting when we're meeting with clients and they say, we want a 3 9 uptime, time. And we're like, well, we don't have any servers up until you make a request. And they're like, oh, but we want a 3 9 uptime." time. I'm like, oh, okay, sure. Um, which is something kind of interesting about, about how we evaluate uptime. So um, here's a kind of a, a simplistic view of our, of our architecture. Um, in the, in the, essentially the, the, the back end or the slow process is you have this S3 data lake that has literally uh, the lab data on hundreds of millions of patients. Uh, we have ETL jobs that run essentially every week that basically cleans, organizes, and uh, uh, package the data and run the first layer of the model. Um, that eventually gives us uh, an S3 bucket that has 210 million rows and then the vectorized embedding and all the features required for model execution. So essentially, the first layer of the model is run slow every, every um, uh, week or so. Um, but then we have over here uh, a set processing workflow. So uh, someone makes a, uh, they actually submit a roster of patients to an S3 bucket. Uh, the, uh, the Lambda architecture is listening to that, that S3 bucket. It says, oh my gosh, I have a new set of patients I need to make a prediction on. Uh, it uses S3 to select to quickly pull in the feature vector. We take that feature vector, we, they, we then predict the RNN features on it to create that, you know, the learn prediction of, of that. Um, uh, we also then uh, uh, combine them uh, and then come out and predict a patient score. Um, and that's all done within a Lambda architecture, uh, which is on the fly. Um, and then you see here really 
all that work is to come up with a number like this, saying this set of patients uh, next year are going to cost X percent more expensive than we think than the than the global average. Um, and so with this with this talk, there's several key takeaways from this. Uh, one, the S3 Select really allowed us to to achieve the speeds that uh, that that fit our solution for just such a fraction of the cost. We were evaluating, does it make sense to put everything in large Redis clusters, do things in memory? Um, in reality, the S3 Select meets us really well, and it's a, it's a massive cost savings. Uh, also, the AWS Lambda architecture, it was perfect for our bursty solution. Um, and then finally, the SageMaker has really helped us a lot in terms of developing and deploying these, uh, these models. And with that, uh, I am done. We also are hiring. So if you're a data scientist, specifically in NLP, and interested in working, uh, please reach out to me or uh, meet me after the talk. But thank you. So if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand. I'll come over with the mic. Why why'd you switch from uh, TensorFlow to PyTorch? Oh, why did we switch from Plensor to PyTorch? Uh, it, when we first started, actually, there was a big, we, we just said, we don't really know which one's better for this application. And we kind of tried them both. We w eventually just chose TensorFlow. But as things went on and the types of models that we were building, PyTorch kind of had better documentation. It had models that we were more likely to use. TensorFlow feels more like a, like an image first type processing framework. PyTorch in the type of, the type of models that we run um, and the type of data that we had just, just seems to make more sense. Um, so we're just starting that migration now. Oh, oh. Which tools did you use for data engineering and ETL? Uh, so we do things in Spark, uh, Scala, uh, Spark Scala. So we have, uh, we use Databricks for a lot of our jobs, which once again are just running on EC2 clusters. Uh, and we take these, uh, basically these big Spark jobs that are able to read in these, these files and then execute uh, through that. So basically just big uh, Scala Spark. Um, clusters for the ETL stuff. Other oh, okay. I was just wondering, who are the primary end users of the data? Are they health insurance companies or? So we have three. Uh, so good question. We have we have three uh, three main verticals that, that use this data. Um, uh, obviously, there's a lot of HIPAA, and and one thing I didn't mention: this data is anonymized, but it's tokenized. So I actually don't know people's names. I just know Dave Rose things. Uh, we uh, first is uh, I would say healthcare providers, so pharmaceutical companies as well as hospital systems, user detection. Uh, also, in this example, was specifically the payers, so uh, uh, large health insurance companies making predictions about patients in health. Um, they use it for things like also intervening, saying, "Hey, uh, you may get to a point where your healthcare uh, your healthcare insurer says, hey, we think you should get this tested just so we can catch it earlier.' It's actually it's really interesting. And then and then labs themselves, so that we actually use a lot of this technology to help these labs power their, their data sets. Hi, I was just wondering what technology are you using to master the patient records? To, to what? EMPI or mastering the patient records, what technology are you using? Or uh, we or actually have some in-house um, solutions that we built. Uh, it's called an Opal that we use to kind of basically manage the records and then keep them anonymized and tokenize them through. It's, it's an in-house thing we built.